Development and Advocacy Network, we are the leading events and webinar platform in African real estate. A platform to connect with stakeholders in the housing industry across the globe. Our platform has over 1,000 live viewers per webinar. Over 20 African and international countries, we engage a heterogeneous audience composed of decision makers. With over 120 minutes per webinar, you can reach over 40,000 global and pan-African audience. Join Nigeria's leading brands, sponsor a webinar episode or series, or host your own webinar through our platform and speak to your own audience. Through our platform, you can reach a new audience composed of real estate developers and investors, property owners and facility managers, banks and financial institutions, construction and civil engineering firms, managing directors and chief executive officers of companies, wholesalers, retailers, property agencies, and even more. For inquiries, call the numbers displayed on your screen. The Housing Development Advocacy Network webinar platform is proudly sponsored by The quality and quantity of available housing stock in any country measures the development and quality of life of her people. On housing development, I make it my top priority to bring to you trending housing information and day-to-day -day housing plight of Nigerians. If he as a civil servant working for my country cannot get access to housing loan, I don't know what else we can do. Can you imagine that somebody will pay for two years rent and is not sure of the next three months money in his pocket? I also analyze the housing policies and strategies of government with stakeholders. Let the federal government next level be seen in the area of housing. Nigeria decides to be housed. Housing issue is a journey of a thousand miles. I don't think that anybody can pretend that we're going to close a 17 million homes down in five years. Housing development is your one-stop source for housing information. Join me. Hello, everyone. It is 12.03 Nigerian time. And it is time for another webinar discussion on the theme, Sustainable and Pandemic Resilience Urban Planning. I want to appreciate all our very important guests. I also want to appreciate all our participants. I can see the figures going up, increasing. The focus today has to do with the issue of town planning. Our city planning is key. And those who are in charge of the city planning, planning what should be the height of the house, what should be the size of the road, what should be the size of the building, are the ones that we have brought on the program. My name is Festus Adebayo. I am the Chief Executive of Housing Development Advocacy Network. I most appreciate our partner in this webinar, and that is Housing Development Program on AIT and the Housing Development Program on Television Continental and Housing Time on Red Power. I must thank all our partners in the media who have already connected, willing and waiting to receive policy statement from our guest speakers. I appreciate all of you and thank you for connecting. With me, folk that will be focusing on the subject of today, they have very important personality from different parts of the world. And I will start with UN Habitat, our guest from the UN Habitat all the way in Kenya. It's Mr. Zing Kwan Zhang, the senior advisor of UN Habitat. We are happy to have you today as a guest on our webinar discussion. Thank you. Sit up in planning and uh, planning space need to be more flexible. Planning need to be also more flexible. And uh, for example, 
provide a diversity and uh, also make the choice more for affordable. This is uh, also the element or needs to be considered when we're planning for pandemic uh, uh, resilient uh, cities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Zikwazak. I think I'll be coming back to you. Uh, let me go to another speaker. Now, I will be going to the FCT Director of Development Control to make his first presentation on this focus of today, Sustainable and Pandemic Resilience of Our Planning, TPL, Mukta. Galadima. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Felix. Sorry, Mr. Festus, my good friend. <laughs> I call participants, our viewers and listeners, it's a pleasure once again okay. having you. A number of objectives have been forwarded and conversed for urban development. Some of these include efficient and effective spatial structure, affordable housing, reduce commuting time, reduce crime rate, and a very efficient transportation network. These objectives have been achieved through the preparation and implementation of a development guideline, what we call the master plan. Further, more, in order to achieve the implementation of the master plan, certain regulations have been forwarded, particularly in this regard, the issue of zoning regulation and setbacks, building codes, etc., etc. One thing that I want us to note today. There is a gradual shift from government to governance. We are also witnesses to the powerful effects of the private sector of the economy. So also the interconnectedness of cities, regions, continents across the globe. We are also witnesses to the globalization of the economy. Also, challenges, policies such as climate change, demographic change, and now to crown it all, we have COVID 19, which is a major challenge to our policy makers and implementers. From this background, then it has emerged that there is a need for a mechanism that will be responsive and flexible when it comes to formulating regulations for cities development. I think on this note, it will serve as a foundation for me and for my co-participants that whatever we are doing as city planners and administrators, we need to be open, we need to be more inclusive, and we have to accommodate the principles of participatory approach as regards to city planning, and administration. So this is my opening remark. I'll be waiting for additional questions. Thank you. Thank you, my director. You had a very good way to start. Thank you, thank you. You have set the ball rolling. <laughs> now, I'll be going to Dennis Papa. Dennis Papa, are you here? Yes, I'm here. You, we have here from the town, the city planner. The man who have been planning Abuja for many years now. People like us, when we are going on the city and we observe something to be a, a, a anomaly, the next thing you see us doing it is to be calling him. I remember one or two, three times I've had reason to snap pictures and then throw it to him. <laughs> And a few minutes, you see him sending his boys there to confirm what I have said. So the man has spoken. 
I want to hear your first presentation today. I met you representing HIFC, International Financial I think, Corporation, and you have been talking to the whole world about a green building. Please, I would like to hear from you. What is the marriage between you, what you have been saying, and the town planners? I want to have that in your first presentation. Great, great, great. So, um, first of all, I would like to ask, I mean, when we say green building, what exactly are we even talking about? Because a lot of people have their own understanding of what green means when it comes to the built environment. But um, for us at IFC, when we say a green building, we are looking at a building that is at least 20% more risk sufficient than a comparable baseline building in the local market. So um, if you listen carefully, you realize that my uh, cash phrase is at least 20% more efficient and then the baseline of the local market. Because some people, when they hear green building, um, we, I mean, they think we are trying to compare how efficient their project is or how they are efficient their building is to another building somewhere else in the world. But no, if we are looking at green buildings in Nigeria, um, what IFC has done is we have a baseline of how people build in Nigeria. And we are trying to ensure that your new project that you are coming to put up is at least 20% more efficient compared to what people in Nigeria are doing with their buildings. And uh, for the efficiency, we are looking at energy efficiency. We are looking at water efficiency and we are looking at the embodied energy in the materials. So these are the three standards that we look at when um, it comes to green building. Now, um, how, how important is it? Um, what you see is that one of the key benefits is um, green buildings help to build some resilience against future energy prices. So as I mentioned, the, um, we, are, we are looking at energy efficiency, and if you design your building to uh, the extent that it is very energy efficient. It doesn't waste energy. It means that in future, when the uh, price increases, um, I mean, when uh, fuel prices or energy prices increases, you really wouldn't be affected because already you designed your building to use the least energy that is uh, to, be, to be used. And also, what we've also seen is that um, when it comes to planning, um, once your building is green and you have that green building certification, it, it prevents your building from becoming obsolete. For instance, um, in the next five years or the next 10 years, there may be some changes in the building regulations of a particular city, which would um, mean that some old buildings would need to retrofit it to be able to meet that particular standard. Um, that's the new building regulation is required. But if your building already is green, What's, what it means is um, no matter the, the changes in the regulation that comes, it is going to be as par with, with it. So um, we, we've seen that in a lot of markets, the value for buildings is much higher because um, we see it to be, um, I mean, something, I mean, we see it to be something that is much more valuable for um, people compared to the ordinary buildings. Yeah, so I'll leave it here, and then, um, if anybody has any other question, we can just follow up on that. Thank you, Mr. Dennis. I'm happy you started by telling us what you mean by your green uh, uh, building and your own uh, e e definition of it. And uh, by the time I come back to you, I already started having questions for you. We use questions to hear more from you for the purpose of uh, digesting this our topic for the day. Now. I'll be going to Mr. Idris for Nahami. We'd like to have your presentation on the topic of today. First presentation on sustainable and pandemic resilience of our planet. What is your perspective? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Barista Festus. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Nigerian time to the participants. Uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, sustainable pandemic resilient urban planning. Uh, I think this discussion uh, is supposed to have even taken place as far back as 200 years back. Not 
they will, that is, we are even late discussing this. I so much envied the town planners because they are the God, G-O-D, small letter G-O-D, of the act. It is the town planners that design yes. that this is a place yeah. that people should reside. Yeah. They design the community, they design the rural area, they design the town, satellite towns, the Peri urban, they design it. And people follow strictly what they have designed. So we have people who have one room, we have people who have two rooms, three rooms, and a bungalow, and a flat. We have three bedrooms, we have duplex. But it is whatever the plan that people follow strictly. So what have they done? In terms of the infrastructure, in terms of housing, in terms of the land use, in terms of transportation, in terms of communication, yes. in terms of people in ID camps, yes. the slums, and all of that. So town mm -hmm. planners are our God on planet Earth. And sustainable, what is sustainability? It should be safe for everybody. It should be affordable. It should be inclusive for everyone. And everybody will wish for more. And when you talk about resilient, look at the type of pandemic we had, and we are still having. It causes across planets. It causes across continents, across countries. Are we resilient? My answer will say no. The entire world is thrown into pandemic mood. Running helter skelter. But I really believe we've taken care based on the advice and suggestion of the town planners who will have been in a better position if they plan a community to have primary health center, to have schools, to have good uh, energy, to have a fantastic waste management system. And we have enforced that the regulations is carried out. We will have been better for it. So they are our God on earth. So I want to see this opportunity to tell them that they should continue to do that, which is good, and enforcement. Because regulation is useless if there are no enforcement and penalty. So regarding energy is the new way to go. All town planners, I envy you so much. As I've said, you have to come up with a regulation that any building, any community that presented a design that does not have an escape route. My own escape route is the alternative energy, the complementary energy, the renewables. Such, no matter how small it is, should be returned for the submission that until we see your escape route, what is the alternative you have for renewable energy? Wind, solar, whatever is available in the immediate environment should be greatly tapped into. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Barrister Festus, for bringing me on board. I'm happy you are representing me here today to ask some questions from the town planners. So, so I'm happy that you are here, and I'm happy I have my reasons for putting you in the team. I must confess that sincerely, I just discovered the importance of time planning recently. I'm happy you are calling them God now, the small God. Even if a developer wants to do anything, the first person that goes into operation is the time planner. 
They are the one that we discover the place. They are the one that we take this is where go there. If that planner does not do their job, we cannot talk of housing. This is the fact. So I appreciate you for appreciating them and appreciating their roles. And that is why we have decided that we are going to partner them in the AIHS, Abuja International Housing Show. In fact, they've called a particular day and call it a town planner day to let the whole world know that these people are important. Even though they are not running a publicity, a campaign to tell you they are important. We have discovered them, so we will do our best to keep telling the whole world how important they are. So now let me go to the former commissioner for physical planning. I would like you to look at what Idris have said. Idris said, appreciated you. He gave, mentioned your roles. And also look at what my the TPM Mukta Galadimawa, the way he started. Sir, I want you to build on their presentation and make your whole first presentation on this platform today. Thank you very much, Mr. Adebayo. Uh, in fact, I think I should begin by awarding an honorary membership of uh, Nigeria Institute of Town Planners to Mr. Fanoami. <laughs> Thank you. Because he, he has a glimpse of what uh, planning should do. Uh, let me start by sympathizing and expressing my condolences to all families that have lost people during this pandemic, not just in Nigeria but all over the world. Um, here in Lagos, only yesterday, we lost one of our very key politicians and uh, a man of repute, um, distinguished Senator Adebayo Oshinowo. May he so rest in peace and other people who have departed. Uh, pain in itself is not a bad thing because what it does for us is to make us realize that something is wrong so and if something is wrong then we have to do something about it secondly i want to appreciate and acknowledge the effort of uh, mr festus adebayo i like to praise your commitment your consistency your persistence and doggedness in this housing matter. You, you've done it better than anyone of recent. And, and I just hope that there'll be a lot of uh, results to your, 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 your effort. Thirdly, I believe that when we are discussing the issue of human settlements and planning our cities post pandemic, we are talking about livability, and sustainability. Part of the definition of urban plan requires that a human settlement be, with, be lived with convenience. And convenience means livability, living without stress. The second is that whatever we are planning for today is able to take care of generations yet unborn. And that's where the sustainability comes in. Whatever resource we have is not to be consumed by us alone, but our great grandchildren will also come and consume. So therefore, these are very important in setting the pace for planning itself. In human settlements, when we talk about planning, we should know that the dominant subject of planning is man, the human being, and the environment upon which he depends. And I would like to say that anywhere in the world where value has not been attached to the life of a human being, there is rarely going to be proper planning, implementation, growth, and development. I repeat again. When no value has been attached to human life, it will be difficult to plan. And therefore, there will be lack of sustainability and livability. But the whole essence is man. 
So anything we do, we must have that driving force that this man must not die. Therefore, we must make provision for him. And that's what planning does. Um, Mr. Fonomomi referred to the fact that town planners are gods and that the developer should consult the town planner before he does anything. I, I, I go further than that. You know, planning and having sustainable living environments, it's, just not, it's not just about the town planner. The president of a nation should not be making a policy statement without consulting a town planner. So a president says that he's going to build 10,000 houses in every state of the nation. Where? In the air? In the water? So a town planner has to know all of this because things have to be put in their right places. A governor shouldn't be making a statement that will build a road from here to Badagri without having the advice of a town planner. Which route is it going to take it through? So all of this just show that, like the normal dictum, they say when you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. So a lot of our settlements, especially in this part of the world, have run into problems be, uh, during the pandemic because of the fact that our settlements have not been well planned. And let me say something about innovation because we'll be talking of innovation. Innovations are not entirely new things. Yes, when you introduce something new, it's an innovation. But it is also possible that you introduce something old in a new way. It's also an innovation. And then it is possible that something you have not been doing before, even if it has been done in decades in other places, when you bring it into your own environment, it is innovation. Therefore, what we are looking at to make our, our settlements sustainable after the pandemic would not just be what is new here alone. It may have been used elsewhere and have been tested, and that's the way to go. Now, the other thing to know is that human settlements, cities, towns, villages, whatever you call them, are founded on land. And land is a finite resource. It's not infinite. And because it is a finite resource, you cannot deal with it as if it is, it, it is reproducing itself. You know, so and because it doesn't reproduce itself, then we must plan it so that it's not just us that are using it, but the coming generations. Finally, one of the things we must re we must know in the planning of settlements is that human settlements are like living organisms. They operate in systems like human beings as living organisms have systems. Man has a circulatory system. Every city or town too has a circulatory system. That's the road network. A human being has a respiratory system, how he breathes. The environment too must have a respiratory system. So that's why we make provision for open spaces for the environment to be able to breathe. And you will find out that when the environment demanded breathing through the pandemic and they needed to set up isolation centers, some of the stadia were made available. So the environment was able to breathe because of the limited ones that we have. He has a skeletal system, and that's the infrastructure. So once the infrastructure available are not sufficient, a body will collapse. If there is no skeleton in the body, the flesh will collapse. And that's why cities, settlements are collapsing. It, it requires a digestive system. And those are the processes and operations taking place everywhere from one sector to the other. It has a nervous system. That's a brain that connects the other part of the body. That's what government does. 
and coming with various information from one sector to the other to make the city system work. It has an excretory system, which is our waste, how we treat our waste. And it has a reproductive system where we reproduce. We have industry, we have agriculture, we have all sorts of things until we begin to view human settlements from that perspective that it, it is composed of a system within systems and that all of them are interconnected and that we must bring this, the real stakeholders, the professionals to participate in the organization. We will not be able to make much progress. I'd like to leave it at that. Thank you. I most appreciate your contribution. You have, as usual, lived up to our expectation again today. You have made some sensitive statements that I want my colleagues in the media to please take note. The president cannot be talking of uh, producing 300,000 of housing projects without considering the input of the town planners. The town planners are very key even when considering the issue of we have to allocate road extension and all sort of thing, we must begin, just as I said in my press statement of yesterday, that it's time for the professionals to come together and take their rightful position in this country. I was reliably informed a few days ago that the major problem that the Federal Ministry of Housing have been facing in delivering those houses have been that the project have been hijacked by some political jobbers who took the contract and now become a problem for the ministry. And that's why I roll out my press statement that it is time that our professionals should rise up and do the right thing. And it is time for the government to engage our professionals. Let us engage them to do the job that they are trained and certified for. Most of these professional institutions are backed by laws. They did not just gather themselves. So I will leave it at that level till when I come back to uh, TPL, Tony, and Ibe. Now we'll be going back to Kenya. Me, uh, Mr. Zing, Zang. Our cities are collapsing. Collapsing seriously. And a lot of people are blaming the government. Some are even blaming the people who are the town planners that are, being, that are in the service of the government. Please, I want you to talk to me on the issue of incorporating the human dimension to urban and rural development. What is the best way, having just experienced the lockdown of COVID-19? So, if I understand that you want me to talk about uh, the, the lower element. In the yes. urban, uh, uh, now, when we see uh, Africa cities uh, like uh, Nigeria cities full of uh, migration, migrants, so many people they migrate from the rural area to urban areas. Now, they have, do not have a certain financial uh, resources. So they end up in the informal settlement or slum areas. So uh, why the people, there are so many people moving from the rural area to urban areas? Because in the rural areas, there's a lot of low income or poverty uh, issues. So compared to rural areas, cities represent uh, an opportunity because urban productivity is an average is higher than rural areas. So that uh, many people perceive when there's uh, bigger cities, big opportunities. So they try to move to uh, bigger cities. But uh, because uh, for many people uh, suddenly moving into the cities, there's not good, sufficient opportunities, uh, job opportunities for the people. Uh, for all the people. So they end up with uh, have open poverty, slums, whatever. So 
So the, that's the way to address the random loss. Rams are low income, up in crimes. So to address the up and low run linkages. So we sort of promote a random uh, up and low run balance of development. Particularly, we should develop also uh, not just develop a bigger cities like Lagos. We also need to develop a medium sized cities and also small towns. So this uh, small towns, medium sized cities can uh, function as a linkage between larger cities and the rural areas and uh, allow more people to find the opportunities in small towns and in the middle. Uh, we decide the cities. So to avoid, for example, the explosive demand for infrastructure, because uh, African cities <coughs> also lack of financial resources. They have, for example, uh, municipal revenue per capita is much lower than the world average. So they do not have uh, sufficient resources to provide uh, infrastructure and uh, affordable housing. So it's a gradual process, one important. Accommodate many people. It, it's a small level and a middle, middle sized city. So make for the more national distribution of the population. So that is one uh, one way. Another way is for important. Promote the. So we are for example now during this uh, COVID nineteen. Pandemic. Many people are talking about uh, innovation, the technologies. And, uh, for larger cities, like uh, as a in, as a, the India of national economic development, particularly like uh, Lagos, how can we find the ad, uh, advantages of the technology edge in the cities? How can we promote, for example, more value-added economic activities in the larger cities? So that's also. Uh, it uh, depends on the national government to allocate uh, the economic resource and also the city government to attract what, kind of, what type of investment into the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Zan. And now I'll be going to the director of the development control of the Federal Capital Territory. I already have two questions for you here, and I'm going to hand my own, so I'm going to push to you three questions at a time. The first has to do with uh, planning of trees. In the past, provisions are always made for nature. I'm be asked to ask you today, are you still following that in FCT? Then I have another question, say, talking about the security, which we need to consider when we are planning. And the, the person sent a message to me, I should ask you, that most of the CCTV in the Federal Capital Territory are not working. How are you able to do some of your job in this area? Now, my own question to you. TPL Mukta. There are lots of standard mass housing projects in FCT. How did they, I don't know how they were able to be standing without you guys knowing. What is your department doing? I want you to roll out a policy statement on this. We must stop some standard houses. I have seen, I remember the other time I saw you supervising a particular place in Lokogoma. More than two, three, four times. How do we do a lot of prevention? than kill in, in your in, in LCT plan plan. Thank you. Thank you. We're able to uh, arrest an offender who violated our terms and conditions of grant of tree planting. Secondly, now it's mandatory that we are not going to grant you certificate of habitation until number of trees are planted within that property. Three, 
We are in collaboration with Department of Parks and Recreation to ensure that for every single tree that is felled, we must have three numbers to replace one. Because looking at the climate change, urban, there is need for trees to help us sustain the environment and protect the environment. As regards to the issue of uh, security in the FCT, some times back, a contract was, was awarded for installation of CCTV throughout the capital city. But somehow along the line, something happened, which is beyond the Office of Development Control. It has to do with the FTT Police Command and the Office of the IGP. As regards to the issue of abandoned mass housing and substandard housing, important, let me reel out the history of mass housing in the FTT. During the end of Engineer Abbagara, certain individuals and corporate entities were identified as competent housing developers. They were allocated lots covering about 100 hectares. The intention was they should develop these houses for the low income earners. Unfortunately, there was no adequate planning for these projects. What I mean, planning in this context, the structural plans of such districts and the detailed land use plans of such districts were not prepared. Allocations were made right away for the So no consideration was given to infrastructure facilities and services. And because of these allocations, they were given time limit of six months to start development. So once they collect their letters of allocations, they move to site without recourse to Department of Development Control as a then. So whatever they received, they moved to site and then most of these places were not open. They were in the big bushes. So the most side commenced development without proper supervision. Consequently, somewhere along the line, by the time some of the districts were detailed planned, most of them were found to have been on proposed road corridors, on proposed corridors of services such as sewer and water line. And unfortunately for most of these developers, they didn't have our building plan approvals. Now the consequences are obvious. We have seen flooding in Lokogoma. We have seen buildings on water lines. We have seen buildings on proposed road corridor. One thing about the Abuja master plan, in as much as it is flexible, it has never given room for compromises as regards to the issue of corridors for infrastructure, facilities, and services. We can accommodate anything, but we cannot compromise infrastructure or corridors for infrastructure, facilities, and services. So that's why you see us, we have to cover some of these corridors. So in short, there was a kind of uh, discord, disconnect, lack of synergy between the planners and the a lot of uh, administrators and developers. That's why when you go uh, around most of these mass housing districts, you see some of the development within plot plains, some of them on road corridors. But we have to implement the plan as it is because so much amount of resources have been committed into the Africa project. At this point in time, we cannot just send it. We have to uh, enforce, we have to implement it as planned. Because Keep a, an illustration of, uh, let's say, water pipeline coming from Lower Sumadam, going to Apo to Tansis along Wasa Road. There is no way you can say, okay, let's fear up the pipeline because of this interest. No, it has to go. For most of these plants, we are built without approval. Most of these properties we are built without approval. Why we are trying to make a kind of damage control? As regards to granting as built approval, we have to go by the provisions of the plan 
with regards to infrastructure facilities and services. As I'm, I'm telling you to the world, there is no compromise as regards to provision for infrastructure facilities. Because Abuja is the dream of all Nigerians, indeed Africans. This is one city that we are all proud of, that yes, it is planned from the scratch, it has been implemented, uh, most nurtured by Nigerians and Africans in this. So there is no way we can just sacrifice it and compromise it because of certain institutional weaknesses perpetrated by some people. So what is right must be done right. Thank you. It's really a, a, a serious business in the federal capital territory. And I, I don't have it, my brother, in the development control at all because of the nature of the job uh, is doing there. Uh, one of my reporters just brought it to my knowledge that uh, about two weeks ago that uh, TPL moved to Garadima, arrested uh, a man for cutting down a tree, where, which is totally uh, against their rule. And that's great. And uh, I'll be coming back to you. Because as somebody just said another question, whether you have you have uh, you derive joy in pulling down houses, or maybe that is your last uh, resource. Maybe you just have anointing for pulling people houses uh, down. So be getting ready to answer me that uh, that area. So we want to know whether your business in development country just pull it down, not to build. I believe you answer me. So this is it for all the people that are connected to us uh, in the media. So you can all hear what the development control of the FCT has been doing. Really, it's, it's not an uh, easy job, for, especially for those in development control offices in all this federation of Nigeria. People use their positions all the time. Uh, we have cases of people who have built houses in the green areas in the FCT. We have many of them. We have many of them. And they are close to the power that be. When they are close to the power that be, I would a director or con the, 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 the control them. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. That will be taking it to Mr. Idris. Mr. Idris, you have been living in Abuja for some years. And today we are discussing sustainable and pandemic resale of urban planning. You know what has been happening. They told our people that are living in the slum, in different villages in Abuja, to be using water to wash their hands every minute. But some of those people don't have access to water. They told them to be using water, but there's no water. So I don't know what we'd like to say with the solar that we have just uh, you, uh, we have just talking about. You mentioned about solar, the new alternative. You got to say so. What do you think is the way forward? Our city must be well planned. I see people coming every morning from Mas from from a massacre to Abuja. Then you see hold up. They are all some of them are coming to the city. Is it that it is not possible for the for those companies to have their branches in those areas? And that's one area I'll be also talking to uh, TPA Tony and So please tell us: must be, must all the people come to the city at the same time? What is the way house? So, Mr. Idris, please. Thank you so much, uh, Barristers Testers. Uh, before I go to that, I will want to. Uh, uh, quickly shipping something to what Town Planner and they said. He said innovation, that nothing is new on art, and that is fantastic. It's true. Our father had residing in the mud houses using thatched roof. The, the, my grandfather to my mom the bed is an orthopedic bed built with mud. Mm -hmm. Orthopedic bed. So you can imagine that they have foresight. So I want to go with that innovation, which has been developed by Mocker Foam and all the rest now, and called uh, orthopedic bed. We've been using it before. We've been using fridge before. They call it Amu in the Yoruba area. So nothing is actually new. Then let me talk about uh, Zang. You know, migration is natural. To you, you see it as migration, 
that the people migrating see it as escape route. They believe that they are not provided for in terms of infrastructure, road, water, light, good environment. So they want to go to the city to enjoy those facilities, thereby overpopulating the city because the city has no plan for that. Now to Abu Dhabi city. It's a wonderful thing. If you have been in Abuja since 98, and on the airport road in those days, it's a tug of war. But today, because of adequate planning, you can see that the six lanes, everybody are fantastic. You that is going to airport road can go, Jabi can go, Lokogama can go, City Gate can. It, the flow is fantastic. And that is what we are saying. Everything revolves around the town planners. I keep saying it. They are our God on Earth, planet Earth. But one big gap that I've noticed is issue of monetary enforcement and penalties. If the town planner has said, each and everybody should plant a tree. But when they are building, nobody visits them again. You discover that the guy has used the space for car park. So I didn't be the town planner in their team are going to do the enforcement, monitoring based on what they have proved, they will have stopped the uh, guy immediately. But they will not be there, they will wait until the construction is completed. Then they will go and mark for demolition. That is reactionary, that is reactive, is punitive. Prevention is always better than cure. So the enforcement should be strengthened so that by the time the builders are building, and one thing I appreciate about them, they, they require you to put the architect seal, to put the planner seal, to put every seal. But after the approval is given, did they follow up? If somebody has gone to borrow the seal of Barista's Festus, just for approval purposes, so, as much as they have planned the mass housing, they are not being considered, just as time planner and they said. Government, before making any blanket comments, should consider the town planner. The mass housing we are saying, where should we have it? Then the other slum, the Bible even recognizes that the poor will be in your midst and that the rich to take care of them. What are we saying? A big man needs a driver. He needs a dry cleaner. The dry cleaner lives in Massacre. Where the guy lives, you did not make provision for road, no provision for water, no provision for light. The guy will want to sleep with you in my tower. But if he's adequately taken care of and there is good transportation system such that he can travel from Massacre, from Suleja, from Zuba to Abuja within 30 minutes, one hour, I'm telling you by God's grace tomorrow, many people will relocate to Massacre. So the planning people should really help so that all the waste that we are gathering, that are attacking the climate change, the environment, can be managed. People are turning waste to waste in some other countries, in some other climates. What are we doing? What is the recycling? We've been hearing what, are, what is happening in Nigeria. So those are the areas we should look at. Otherwise, our environment will not be happy with us. 
It's just as if a rain is falling and there is no proper drainage. If we find this road, it must create a way for itself. That if it is properly planned, if it can be invested, recycled, reused. So thank you, uh, Mr. Fenster. The town planner, everything is on their desk. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Idris. I appreciate your contributions. And uh, I will be coming very soon to TPL Chunyanyi Day. I have a lot of questions for him here. And uh, a lot of people asking questions. That some people say town planners are not part of the building team. How true is that? How will the COVID-19 pandemic impact our cities and communities over a long time? So I'll be, I'll be preparing to answer those my questions. I'll be back to you very soon. If you are just joining this webinar discussion, we are focusing on sustainable and pandemic resilient urban planning. That's our focus today. And we cannot be discussing this kind of important uh, team without having the representative of the United, uh, UN Habitat. So here today we have the representative of UN Habitat, Zeng Hua Zhang, a senior advisor of the UN Habitat with us. We have the director of development control is part of us today. This is the one representing all other development control directors in the nation. And uh, we have the former commissioner for, 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 for uh, physical planning in Lagos State. Uh, who have excellent record of performance, uh, who, have been, who have been talking on the program to share the experience. I have a representative of IFC Edge Building, who, Mr. Dennis, who have also been talking to us about greenhousing. And uh, I have Mr. Idris, the CEO of FOMBO Energy and Housing Advocates, which is also part of us. Wherever you are joining us all over the world, we are focusing on the way forward for our city plan. And now, Mr. Papa, Dennis Papa, I'd like to ask you, with COVID-19, with what we are passing through, what can we say will have been the support or the impact of greenhousing of COVID-19? Green building versus COVID-19. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot. I would, I'd say it's even more important than ever um, for us to be looking at green building now because, because of the uh, functions that green buildings play. Uh, currently, if you realize, um, the one of the main cure, even though there is no vaccine, uh, the safest place to be is to be in your home. Right, to be in your home. And if, if you are in your home and your building itself isn't built to be green, how can you really get yourself cured? Or how can you really enjoy yourself being at home? Um, stuff such like uh, daylight, I mean, natural ventilation has been seen as one of the uh, main important things now. People are being encouraged not to be using their conditioning because of. Um, the fact that the virus may stay in the room and all that, but if you have natural ventilation and, and then stuff like daylight, and all of these are some of the recommendations that green buildings make. So in, in, in effect, um, green building, I mean, when the project, when the building is built green, you are protecting yourself from all of these pandemics. And um, I would also like to states that, I mean, elsewhere, the, um, for instance, during the financial crisis in 2008, um, some countries actually used the opportunity to improve upon their green buildings. Um, and you can talk of uh, the USA and then the Republic of Korea and Germany that actually provided some financial stimulus for construction at that time. One, so that it could um, help boost jobs, um, it could um, help improve the, the, the construction industry in the country at that time. So this, this also brings an opportunity for uh, governments across the developing world 
what can we do in a time like this? I mean, even after the pandemic, what sort of uh, contributions can we put in the construction industry to, to help, I mean, to help improve people's livelihood? And one way of looking at it is to ensure that um, we take advantage and then make sure that projects that are coming up wouldn't just be just ordinary building. There will be buildings that would be pandemic proof so that in future, if there is any other outbreak or there's any other problem, um, we would be comfortable knowing that um, we, we have very safe buildings to uh, be in. Right, and um, there are a lot of other research that is even showing that even in green hospital, the uh, rates of uh, people getting well, it's, it's better than hospitals that are not green. All because these, these hospitals have the requisite measures in there that helps the sick. Yeah, I will, I will leave it here for now and then uh, take any questions. When I come back, you will have to expand more. One make a house to be qualified as a green housing. And then how can we make a house to be pandemic proof? Because I'm sure some of the listeners will be interested in know how to go about this. But at this point, I'll be going to uh, TPL, Tony Aide. I have told him my questions, but I need to repeat them. Question one to you. Former Commissioner for Physical Plan in Lagos State, a senior town planner in Nigeria. We want to know from you, from this question, that some people said that town planners are not part of building team. How true is this? Then the second question is, how would the COVID-19 pandemic impact our cities and communities? over time and i want to put my own third question to you which i go to answer within three minutes sir. and the question is what are the lessons that your institute nigeria is your time planners and your professional members have learned from covid 19 that you cannot put into crucial practice Uh, thank you very much. Um, let me start the way you you enumerated the questions. Yes. Um, I think one needs to appreciate the low level of awareness thank you. of the field of urban planning. I'm happy and uh, that, that's why you, you can pardon anyone who says that the town planner is not part of the building okay. team. Now, when people hear of planning, the only thing that comes into their mind is the building plan. And truthfully, building plan is the pedestrian aspect of urban planning. It's the, it's the, it's the most minute area that the planner is least concerned about. Because there are frameworks sitting in themselves as a system within which a building plan must sit. And if those frameworks do not exist, the building plan itself is null and void. It is like building something on nothing. A nation like Nigeria is supposed to have a national physical development plan. How do our capital cities connect? Where are our airports, how are they relatively located? So if there is an airport in Lagos, does it make sense for another one to be in Abel Kuta because it is a state capital? Because by the time the aircraft takes off, it is landing again because of the short distance. So a national physical de uh, development plan helps us to know how our nation is supposed to grow. We have, in our own wisdom, created what we call geopolitical zones. Those geopolitical zones are regions that are supposed to have plans on their own. How the, the states within each region connect and they can interdependently 
benefit from one another. Then we have every state that is supposed to have a regional plan. Now, when Mr. Fonohomi was talking, he spoke about migration. Migration happens because a lot of states do not have a regional plan. What does a regional plan do? It balances the development and growth between all settlements within a state. So you see how all of them link and how they relate. So it's like sitting on a two-legged bench. If you have about eight people on a two-legged bench and somebody begins to stand up from the left, the next person stands up, the next one stands up, when it remains only one person sitting on that bench at the edge, the bench will tilt. So for every development that has not been balanced, there is a tilt from the rural areas to the urban areas because the pressure of development is only in the urban area. So to answer to migration, our, our, our governors, our policymakers must embrace uh, planning in its full scale, in its whole hierarchy. None is without the other. And from a regional plan, you can begin to talk of master plans of each city. Because a master plan is a policy document, it is subdivided into other zones, into sectors, into districts, into neighborhoods. So until you have a neighborhood plan, you can identify your house. As first stop, identify your, you know that this is my plot. And the next one belongs to Galadima. And the next one is a clinic. So the day somebody wants to come and build a hotel on the clinic site, because you already have a neighborhood plan and you know what it is, then you reject it. Until we have that, every building plan that is not connected to a neighborhood plan, a neighborhood plan not connected to a district plan, a district plan not connected to a sector plan, a sector plan not connected to a master plan, a master plan not within the context of a regional plan, all are null and void. So we are not serious about planning. And it's because we are ignorant from the top to the bottom. So if we must really have an organized environment like other nations of the world, we must embrace it. It is a must. I don't argue that people should uh, recognize plan. Don't recognize it. We will all live in the mess. We will all live in the com confusion. I told us that it is, it is a system. It has a circulatory system. If there is a clot in the blood, the man will have a stroke. So when there's a congestion on the road, there's already a plot. And all of these things, planning can answer. We must begin to think now. When there was a governor that said he was going to build 100 bungalows in his state for a land that generations are still coming to live on in a hundred years time. Where is that land? So planning tells us that this is the limit of our land. This is how we must develop. We can't continue to do bungalows. We have to go high rise so as to take advantage of that space and have other land for landscaping, for recreation, and all other things. So you can't now have somebody who is the, uh, is, is the, uh, is the one in charge of all of that and say that he's not part of the building team. Where, 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 where will the building be situated? So, if we must get things right, as in other clients, that the planner is regarded as part of the building team, he has a role, his role to play, though at a higher level. And even when you are doing that microcosm of a building plan, he still has to ensure that it is in consonance with the higher plan. Secondly, lessons for for NITP, yeah, we, we, we suddenly discovered that we can't be traveling like uh, we did before. We're supposed to have had uh, three workshops now, or two. The second one is supposed to take place in July. But it has opened our eyes to virtual meetings. Uh, and I will say that our Lagos State chapter really took leadership in that because they used the time before Zoom came to be, they used the time on WhatsApp to conduct some interviews. And it was very rewarding, knowing that although we may not see ourselves physically, but we can connect. And I think that's a new 
that's a new uh, normal for us. Uh, and going forward, we're going to explore that. What's the effect of pandemic? Pandemic has suddenly made us realize that we are all vulnerable. It's so gladdening to the heart that this pandemic has helped both the rich and the poor, the high and the low. It has held us, all of us, in one place. Nobody can go anywhere. And so we must begin to think, are we conducting our lives right? There are people who will kill you if you do not allow them to go to mosque on Friday. There are people who will shoot you if you don't allow them to go to church on Sunday. Pandemic has made us realize that if you truly know God and you want to serve God, then you can actually serve him in your house. And let's even say that we're not serving him. Let's even assume that we're not, we're not serving him. Are we dead? So when somebody is on a duty in the office and he has not finished that duty and he says, yeah, please, I want to go and pray. Does it not make sense? Doesn't it teach us now that service to humanity is the true service to God? That, I think, is what the pandemic has taught us. Thank you. TPL, I will not allow you to go. I have something to ask you so that my colleagues in the media can go with it. 300,000 housing units to be delivered. New agenda for the federal government of Nigeria. What is your message as a senior town planner? Before I move to TPL Mukta, the TPL Mukta cannot be making comments on matters like that. He's still very much in service. But you are a volunteer and you are also a senior, a senior town planner. Close to, I need you to speak about this issue of 300,000 housing units for Nigeria. How do you think they should do it? What do you think is the way forward? What should be the role of town planners? Well, let me, let me say that I am still a public servant because once a public servant, mm -hmm. uh, you are always a public servant. That's one. But two is that as a town planner, my responsibility actually is to the community. The responsibility is to the community because once a, the person in the community is not feeling the impact of the planner, the planning has failed. But planning should not fail if those in authority, policymakers, recognize that planning is a tool that will help them to achieve all their promises. That's why there must be a constant handshake between those in political appointment and the urban planners, whether planners in the private sector or planners in the government sector. Because truth is that, see, Everything you see in the world is created twice. First in the brain, yes. and then secondly in reality. So the town planner has to create the city in the brain and put it on paper. And what we learned in design school is that if you do not fail on paper, you are unlikely to fail on land. And then that plan, because it's dynamic, because you are dealing with human beings, you are required to monitor it and review it constantly, which is what brings me to what Mr. Fonawami said about uh, monitoring. See, monitoring requires a lot of money that government is not willing to commit. Enforcement requires a lot of money that government is not willing to commit. And until we commit money into bringing ourselves under discipline, we are unlikely to achieve it. 300,000 housing units. It's a vision. And I always like to encourage visions. I haven't seen the blueprint of how it will go. But I can tell you that whatever we want to achieve, we only need to determine it in our hearts is what we can achieve. Whether the government itself should go directly into construction is what I doubt. I think the government should provide an enabling environment. That's one. Two is that for us to be able to achieve this 300,000, we should be willing and ready to industrialize housing production in Nigeria. 
there are going to be years ago have I forgotten maybe by at uh, around 2015 or 2016 I made a calculation of how many doors that would be needed just for 10,000 housing units throughout Nigeria 360,000 housing units those doors are able to keep some carpenters in Nigeria in employment for years we can decide to start manufacturing door locks and my brothers in Abia State, in a rare rare market, will be able to do that efficiently. The, uh, the, uh, the Defense Industries Corporation in Nigeria is able to do that effectively. Let's turn these things into an industry such that we standardize it. So anybody knows that you want to buy a door, you should be able to go to Leventy stores. You should be able to go to ShopRite and buy a door because it's already standardized. That's what happens in other countries. So let's, let's make it an industry. Let's use our local resources and go only for what we cannot produce. Finally, I also want to talk about our design and our method of construction. We use the normal wet construction. Uh, while I was in office as Honorable Commissioner, uh, well, I say this without the permission of Professor Lusanya. He was one of those who brought up a, a model, a model of assembling, assembling a building. And once you have prepared all of the prefabs in, in a batching plant, you can just bring them and in a few weeks, you can put up a six floor building of 48 units, well ventilated, just like Dennis has been saying, well ventilated. So we need to look locally at our designers let them do these things for us and then we have a pilot and once we succeed we can ramp up thank you very much before you go i will ask you a question on the location the sagari housing scheme failed because it was wrongly cited i will also need your advice on that when i come back for your last uh, statement on the program today now okay, sir. I'll be moving to the town planner. I try to protect him from uh, over. <laughs> but I have two questions for you here. TPL uh, Mukta, the first have to do with number one. Can any of the panelists explain why physical planning is held in high regard by policymakers in developed countries? Why it is a struggle in developing countries? And the second question goes also. Direct to TPL Mukta. And the question is this How is your agency, the agency for planning, how is the agency planning to stop quackery in the planning profession? This prevents registered professionals from achieving required development. They want to know how you are handling uh, uh, quack in your system. Uh, but my own question, my own question that I would like to have to you is TPL Tony said planning have to do with satisfaction of the, the local dwellers. I will want you to use this opportunity to showcase what you have been doing. That you can say that we that are living in Health City have been enjoying. I know you have been doing well, but at this moment around, I want you to on your own. So case your achievement, great thing you have been doing for the betterment of we residents in the federal capital territory. Thank you so much for this opportunity, Mr. Fiscus. First, let me start with the issue of planning being regarded in high esteem in advanced economy. Mm -hmm. We are here struggling in Nigeria. Yeah. It has to do with our social economic development. Traditionally and historically, we have this uh, planning uh, concept within our traditional settings. Mm -hmm. They go to the northern, particularly the house settings. Settlements were well organized and planned. With traditional uh, chief's houses being the focal point, the markets, the prisons, other places of common interest. 
but also in the southwest and southeast. But uh, with the monetization of the economy and colonization of the settlements, some of these things gradually eroded. Yeah, we can give kudos to the investors in trying to classify our settlements and planning for them. But as they left, unfortunately, the Nigerians in us, we have to turn mentality, not appreciating and not maintaining what is good. Consequently, our settlements begin to degrade it. Mm. And this is not far away from the fact that the government or the policy makers help to recognize the importance of planning. Because there is no activity you will carry on space without the input of planning and planners if you really want to succeed. Unfortunately, administrations, times past, have paid lip services to planning. That's what I mean, planning, I mean, town or urban original planning. Just like my senior colleague pointed out, if we have, if we had original plans, master plans, our settlements could have been better than what they are now. Yeah. But all these things, we have uh, master plans being prepared for different and many settlements. Most of them ended up in uh, shelves. So it's one thing to plan and it's another to implement the plan. Unfortunately, people, uh, uh, policy makers have failed, to, have failed to implement our plans. That's why planning is not giving that recognition. So long as we don't recognize town planning as a very achievement in every settlement, then we will never go anywhere as regards to city or uh, settlement progress. Then the issue of quackery yeah. in the implementation of plans. If you recall, about a month ago, I went out in the field monitoring development. I spotted a development ongoing. Unfortunately, there was a case of forgery of my involvement. We have instances related to professional bodies, attitude of some of our that have tried to deviate from what we have approved for them by adding or minus uh, subtracting certain elements in building projects. Thirdly, we have reported instances of some of the professional colleagues who use their seal to endorse wrong drawings mm. or substandard designs. Mm. So that notwithstanding, we have several meetings with professional that we need their support to step out the type of type of in the city, particularly as regards to building projects. Not that we are sleeping, but we are up and doing. And I make sure that all people that have nothing to do with development of the outing, we send them out of our premises. And we do this, we inform and we inform development professional bodies. And we also uh, request for the assistance in helping us to monitor this development in the field so as to check and and then the last question of satisfaction of the local dwellers uh, i would say with all sense of modesty just like uh, it is what i say it's pointed out the contribution of the fct administration towards uh reducing congestion on our traffic it's one thing is because uh we can we don't do it in isolation we do it in isolation with other agencies but what we are doing that is fundamental now is that we try as much as possible to involve relevant stakeholders as regards to assessment of development proposals as well as granting development permits. And we also try to sensitize communities that are being affected that are, will not be seen in bad light, that all we know is to demolish structures. No, before we any structure, we have to go extra mile by educating those concerns why we are moving those structures because we believe now we should be planning with the people not planning for the people 
So this is one thing that, uh, obviously, we can say that we are doing as regards to development control. And then finally, what uh, Idris said, which uh, we have already, uh, already taken note is the issue of uh, the low income earners. Because we see that and we believe that there is no way you can build a city only for the rich. So now we are insisting for every comprehensive development, there are more production for a single room so that the low income earners can be part of that development. In a nutshell, this is what we are trying to do. You see that the low income earners are also part of the CT project. They are also integrated in the Abuja project. So in a nutshell, this is what we have been doing as our own contribution to the development of Abuja. Thank you. Please don't go, my director. Yes. They, a lot of people always call you uh, your agency as a demolition agency. Uh, though that name was so pronounced on you during the previous administration of my friend and brother, TPL Yusuf. I remember yes. I, I, at the time I had to set up a segment on AIT to, to be featuring your representative every week with the motive of enlightening people. Come, do you really have anointing for pulling people's houses down? Is that your joy? Because in the past, we used to have a minister who said that whenever a house is pulled down, that is when it's happy. Please tell the whole world, tell us your whole feeling. Is it that you have, your hobby is pulling people's houses down? Or tell us, why do you pull down? Is that your last question? On the contrary, but it's the first and other viewers and listeners, to demolish a structure is not an easy task because it pains us to see that a structure has to come down. But you see, we have to do it because it's necessary. Sometimes we are doing it to safeguard rights and properties. If we don't do it, there may be colossal loss of lives and properties. And sometimes, because all of us will live in the Abuja dream, we have plans for this city. Yeah. And this city is the pride of all Africa. We must gain that plan. We must see the sanctity of that plan. Mm -hmm. Such a way that it must be respected. Otherwise, our dream of having a richer capital will just be a mirage. So, to say the least is that we are happy. We are structures. We are not. But we have to do it. It has become a necessity to do it. Thank you so much. You, you, Thank I, you. I, I'm one of those people who can attest to your activities. That is the problem with Festus. Some people are my friend. Whereas some people have been firing there. I remember a minister called me this morning and said, Festus, you are firing from different channel. <laughs> <laughs> so I have no reason to fire any missiles to development control. And in fact, I can testify to what they are doing. So we want to encourage you to do, keep doing your best and let it be on your record. Just like the way I, I brought a TPL Tonya in day here, he did not know that I monitor his activities in Lagos State at the Commissioner for Housing. So today, uh, for physical planning, today we, I can testify. I'm sure if I tell you some things, he will not, he will not believe it. Uh, I was party to, to it when he was the Commissioner. So I hope also the future we acknowledge you, your contributions to uh, physical development of the FCT. And that is the, we have reached the end of uh, our webinar discussion today. Our time is fast spent. Uh, if we keep talking, talking, issue of, issue of uh, about development and power planning is a very important issue. I've received uh, another question that just come in again, but we will not be able to take them. You can keep sending those questions to my phone. I will find a way around it to get answers to you. So, to my very important guest speakers, I want you to say your last statement on the program of the today's webinar. Let me start from Ghana. Mr. Dennis Papa, I'd like to hear your last statement in two minutes today. Okay, thank you, Vice Sandaya. So, um, in a nutshell, all I want to say is I mean, this pandemic actually provides us with an opportunity for us to shift towards green construction. And I mean, possibly some other countries are even thinking about uh, zero carbon buildings, buildings that do not emit any carbon at all. 
However, one thing that we need to also do in uh, our country, in, in Nigeria, is to actually educate people on what green building means. Because the, um, the, the kind of meanings that people put for green buildings makes it very difficult to achieve. But once um, we are able to educate people and let people know exactly um, the kind of thing that qualifies as green, things such as uh, having a building that has enough natural ventilation, you don't have to put on your light even in the afternoon so that you can see a building that um, has enough shading, is very comfortable to live in. These are some of the very simple things that uh, we talk about when we are um, advising people on green buildings. And these are things that if you look at um, our um, original architecture, that is how we used to build until we put all of that away and then uh, went to borrow from the white man uh, without looking at how effective it is for our climate. So these are steps, some of the stuff that we really need to take a second look at so that um, in future, whenever there is any issues, uh, whenever there is any pandemic, we would still be uh, protected. I would end it here, and uh, I'm so happy you to give me this opportunity to be on this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Papa. Uh, I would suggest, I want to thank you, and I would suggest to you the need for you to work with Nigeria Institute of Plant Planners. I remember, is it here last year? Yes, they organized a program on a green building. I was at the point of calling you at the IFC to join them. And I would like to use this opportunity, since a lot of plant planners are connected, to suggest to you the need for you to work uh, with them. Uh, TPL Mukta Galadema is the one in charge of the FCT management. And uh, if you have a good relationship with him, he can also ask, help us, help you, help IFC to share the news about the green building. So we will do our best to foster a relationship, a synergy, a collaboration between IFC and the professional uh, Nigerian store plant planners. Now, I will be going for the final statement. I will not take my friend from UN Habitat because I've just sent him a message. He's having problem with the network over there. Uh, I'll be going to my partner, my housing advocate, Mr. Idris. I need you to round up your statement today on this first platform. Thank you, uh, Barista Hestos. Uh, two things I want to say. One, look at the harsh goal. Goal number 11 mm. for the sustainable development goal that we are striving to achieve come year 2030. What does it say? He said, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Yes. And the first key point is housing for all. Yes, I am blessed to assure that all the panelists and participants either woke up from the house today to wash us, or they are in the house, or they are in the office. So it implies that no matter the category, there must be housing for all. Mm. It is very germane. Then secondly, I will let us look at hash SDG 7, sustainable energy. Energy for all. Renewable, what are we doing? And uh, that is from Ghana, I've said it. What are the eco-friendly materials that can be used in developing our houses? Mm. And finally, to the town planner in the house, they are our God on this planet Earth. Mm -hmm. As we have an escape route for staircase from the kitchen in case of havoc, let's have a complementary renewable energy for every structure. 
uh, students need a reading lantern. It's not too expensive, 3,000 era. That can be sustained for five, six, seven years. Some people in the village do not need fridge or air conditioner, but they need to listen to radio to know what is happening. They cannot afford to buy battery. Why don't we give them a radio that uses solar? So try and see in your planning approval that what efforts are developers making to accommodate the less privileged, the vulnerable, and God will help us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hines Wanami. I want to appreciate you for your wonderful presentation on this, uh, the last few minutes. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Now let me move down to TPL Mukta Galadima to say his last words. I think that last word should be to also renew his commitment as uh, this report is going to be on television. Assure the people of FCT that's committed to them and we always attend to their needs. Mr. Pestus, I can't thank you enough for the wonderful job you are doing for us. As I started in the beginning, so I shall end. Okay. We should note that there is a gradual shift from government to governance. Okay. We should note that the private sector of the economy are becoming more powerful. Mm. We should also note that mm. in contact, uh, interconnectedness between cities, regions, and continents are getting closer. Mm. And we should also note that the economy of the world is becoming more globalized. Then, there are challenges in terms of climate change, in terms of demographic change, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. In view of this, there is no way we have to also rework our policies. Thank we have to review our standards. Thank you. We have to make it inclusive. We have to make it flexible to accommodate the needs of all shares of life. I'm sorry low income, medium income, and high income. Based on this, we have opened our doors and windows. We welcome contributions. We welcome criticisms from all and sundries so that we can meet our, can meet our work better and to enhance our service delivery. We are not minding, we are not forgetting that we need to be on ICT 247 and we are working hard to make sure that we enhance our service delivery so that everybody will be carried along. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, my director. I'm pleased to hear your, your commitment. Thank you, thank you. Now, like to hand. Yes, yeah, now, yes, I can see it, uh, Mr. Singh Zwang. Mr. Singh, we want you to say, I think will be, this issue of your audio has really affected you today. I think I will look for a better opportunity in the, uh, in the future. I will send the message to you on WhatsApp. We we'll schedule maybe one on one with you all the way from Kenya. But for rounding up this program today at your hand, we need a closing remark from you. A closing remark as an important message we like the participant to take away. Last word. Okay. Can you hear me? Like he has a network software, it's not here. Mr. Zan, can you hear me? It's connected to audio. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Why he's trying to connect? I can't get his audio. Let me take TPL Tonya in the last statement for this webinar discussion today. Well, you, you will recall that you asked the question yes. the other time about location. Okay, I'm going to address that. So I will, I will just do three issues on the location and some other things. Now, when, when government is embarking on housing provision, so they should ask 
the questions that a normal, an average businessman will ask in his feasibility studies. Housing for who? Why? Did the people say they need the housing? So if you build 10,000 housing in Borno and build 10,000 housing in Lagos, is it equitable? Borno has less than 5 million population. Lagos has more than 20 million population. So housing for who exactly? Why? Why do they need it? Where? And then when do they need it? And how should you build it? Those are questions that government should ask in embarking on housing projects. Going forward, talking about innovations in planning post-pandemic, we should be thinking of plans that promote clean energy, that reduce pollution, and that promote climate change adaptation measures. For example, people should stop concreting their sites. Mass concrete is not ideal. They should use interlocking, style, uh, interlocking tires that allow for water to seep to the ground and reduce the, the run of water. So they should, do, they should embrace technology, use CCTV to enhance their security, and therefore we will have a sustainable environment. Finally, I want to leave this question, and I'm sure Festus should be able to get it across to every chief executive over the states in Nigeria, and probably the president of Nigeria. What percentage of the land of each state has been developed? What percentage is left undeveloped? And considering the fact that states and the whole of Nigeria are a going concern, because in the next 50 years, in the next 100 years, in the next 200 years, we won't be around. Will, will those states still have land for development? Thank you. What a good way to end today's webinar discussion on the subject of sustainable and pandemic resilience of urban planning. I must say a very big thank you to all the participants who have been connected in the last two hours. We want to say a very big thank you. We want to say we appreciate your connection. Some of you have been connecting from outside the country, some of you from your office, some of you from your home. We want to say a very big thank you to you for connecting. And I must also thank my very important guest speaker who have made today the wonderful webinar, which is, this is our 14th webinar since April. Those ones that we previously did were submitted to the office of the vice president. And that is why I have to mention to my speakers that some of the decisions here, they go to very high level places. I want to thank Representative for UN Habitat, Mr. Zeng Zhang, the Senior Advisor for UN Habitat, for participating in this uh, webinar discussion today. I, I got your message in case you are able to, to hear me that you have lost your connection. So, it's so unfortunate. Uh, I would have replied to you that I would look for an opportunity to have a one on one webinar discussion with you on the area of specialization so that we can benefit from your wealth of experience. I want to thank my friend Hidris Fonomi, housing, affordable housing advocate. Uh, I want to appreciate you, people like you that have been at my back. Uh, you make me to move and move and you have been a source of authority. I appreciate you for your participation. I appreciate your brilliant contribution today. I must thank my partner, who is the Director of Development Control. Very humble, intelligent, friendly and amiable. Mukta Kalabima. Remember you are our award, our award uh, winner. Uh, you continue and uh, meaning you are our ambassador. And I'm happy you know 
Every time I have issues, I call you, you respond. And uh, I'm happy. If I'd be having some, uh, receiving bad news about you, I wouldn't have been happy. But I want to tell you today, you have been my good ambassador. So stay your good professionalism so that when you finish, and I can see my, uh, my, my guy, the senior <laughs> TPL Tony uh, clapping for you. <laughs> TPL Tony, I must tell you sincerely, uh, I went to your secretariat some times ago when my friend, uh, Umar's wife, was, uh, was the coordinator of uh, uh, Abuja Metropolitan, working with uh, Mukta Galadima. And he told me he's an associate member. I said, associate for where? Where can you be associate? Since when have you become? He said, about 10 years ago. Then I carry his documents, collected your form. You fill it. When the form was ready, I collected it. I took it personally to your power planning secretariat. And they said, exactly the same. He said, okay, why are you the one that brought it? It's like you are looking for trouble for us. I said, there's no trouble. I want to know your procedure. This man is useful for you. If he's in charge of Abuja management and you are still calling your associate, you are making out to feel that something is wrong somewhere. <laughs> and it's not worry. I'm calling for interview. So today, uh, I think uh, Uma is a fellow now. He's a fellow of the institution. So, and I'm happy that uh, TPL idea is happy. You are happy over the way the, the young men are doing in the profession. If they are not making you proud, and people like us are reporting them to you, I'm sure you will not be happy. So I can report to you, Muta is doing well. Now, finally, uh, TPL Tony Ainde, you have exposed yourself more and more to me today. And I must tell you, I will not let you go. <laughs> Once I discover the best, I don't allow them to go. They stay at my back, like a backbone, and I go everywhere, they see my faces, they hear me talking. But a good number of people know that I have people at my back. So today, I have added you to the group. Every time you allow me to be chatting you and on any different issues, and you will guiding me and advising me. Thank you for participating in this event. It was only a WhatsApp message I sent to you and you saw it as a call to duty. I'm waiting for a few years time, or I think two years or three years, when you become the president of the Nigerian Institute of Water Planner. We are going to cash you very early so that you can make enough impact. We want to say thank you to everybody, and this is the end of today's webinar discussion. Thank you, sir. This is the end of today's uh, webinar discussion on sustainable and pandemic talent of our plan. I want to say thank you, everybody, again. Thank you, my speakers, and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Housing Development Advocacy Network, we are the leading events and webinar platform in African real estate. A platform to connect with stakeholders in the housing industry across the globe. Our platform has over 1,000 live viewers per webinar. Over 20 African and international countries, we engage a heterogeneous audience composed of decision makers. With over 120 minutes per webinar, you can reach over 40,000 global and pan-African audience. Join Nigeria's leading brands, sponsor a webinar episode or series, or host your own webinar through our platform and speak to your own audience. Through our platform, you can reach a new audience composed of real estate developers and investors, property owners and facility managers, banks and financial institutions, construction and civil engineering firms, managing directors and chief executive officers of companies, wholesalers, retailers, property agencies, and even more. For inquiries, call the numbers displayed on your screen. The Housing Development Advocacy Network webinar platform is proudly sponsored by The quality and quantity of available housing stock in any country measures the development and quality of life of her people. On housing development, I make it my top priority to bring to you trending housing information and day-to-day -day housing plight of Nigerians. If he has a civil servant, 
working for my country cannot get access to housing loan. I don't know what else they can do. Can you imagine that somebody will pay for two years rent and is not sure of the next three months money in his pocket? I also analyze the housing policies and strategies of government with stakeholders. Let the federal government next level be seen in the area of housing. Nigeria decides to be housed. Housing issue is a journey of a thousand miles. I don't think that anybody can pretend that we are going to close a 17 million homes down in five years. Housing development is your one-stop source for housing information. Join me.